Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Soft Rep Radio. On this episode, I have James Hassan, former Army, former Bronze Star recipient. Um, he wrote a book, and, and this book is a little bit of a title that I want to, I just have to read it, okay? And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, James, and then I'll, I'll, get you, I'll get you to welcome on the show. It's called Good. Kabul, the untold story of Biden's fiasco and the American warriors who fought to die to the end. Is that correct? Or who fought to the end. Yeah. Who fought to the end, yes. Close That's enough. It. Yeah, well, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, man. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, so you've been making the circuit. You've been getting around talking about your book coming up. Is that what's happening? Yeah, yeah. We released on the uh, on the 15th, so people can mm-hmm. find Kabul, um, you know, Amazon or anywhere else. But, um, you know, we've been trying just our best to get um, the word out because one of the reasons that we we wrote Kabul, uh, my, my co-author, Jerry Dunleavy, and I, was that, uh, um, you yeah, we had 20 years of war. 20 years of experiences, um, 20 years of loss and, um, for things to end the way they did. And then with, you know, this explanation from the administration that this was somehow a quote success, that mm-hmm. this was inevitable that, uh, you know, that, well, like, which part was a success? Like just the overall Kabul evacuation was a success because they yeah, feel that the lives uh, lost were yeah, not what, more what than what was Biden lost. Just said the other day. And, uh, yeah. that, that's also what, uh, you know, the messaging from from the White House has been, uh, but that you know that that didn't that didn't sit well because I, I you know I knew people who were in Kabul when that was happening, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, I did it like my tiny little part um, to try and get the interpreters I knew out, um, and thank God they are. But um, it, it uh, realized that there was there's a whole lot that that hadn't been told, and mm-hmm. candidly, I, you know, when we started. I thought that I I had a decent idea what was what everything you know was like or what happened at least, and uh, while writing the book, we realized we didn't even know a third of it, and um, so that's that's really you know there has to be some accountability, mm-hmm. and more more importantly the the guys on the ground and the the, the families of of the thirteen uh, deserve to to have you know the stories told. So more accountability than just going to the VA and saying that your injuries that you sustained overseas deployed were attributed to that situation. More than that kind of accountability to, you know, you want the Biden administration to, um, like, what? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think. What's the accountability, you know, for the situation? Uh, I, I, that was- I, I, honestly, if, yeah. if you were to ask me, I think Secretary Austin and Secretary Blinken should, mm-hmm. uh, should have resigned. The president mm-hmm. should have asked for their resignations. And, and I can go, you know, into as granular detail as you want about mm-hmm. uh, what those failings were. But at the end of the day, I think also accountability, you know, starts, starts with the commander in chief. And that's, that's a totally political matter well, that let me, we let, have to get let into. Me, let me, let me but, say something real quick about that. Wouldn't that mm-hmm. be going back to the commander in chief before him who signed the papers in December saying to evacuate yeah. all U.S. forces and to put that on Biden's plate, President Biden, the former Trump president? Wouldn't that be yeah, his yeah, responsibility? And, you know, and then wouldn't it go back to Reagan, who actually wouldn't it go back to 1979 to the Soviets who invaded Afghanistan, yeah. the people, the beautiful people of Afghanistan? Because if we go back and look at Rambo 3, the movie, when he filmed mm-hmm. Sylvester Stallone, filmed that in Afghanistan and in I the credits. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the, the whole game that he's playing with the horses where they're tossing the goat into the goal. That's legit yeah. with the Afghani people, like the Northern Alliance, like the Mujahideen. That's so when wild. he's over there, so when he's over there play, doing a movie in the eighties, and you know Americans were able to go over there, have a whole film production brought over there. At the very end yeah. of the credits, it says, "Thank you to the like wonderful, beautiful people of Afghanistan." At the very end, because they are a wonderful, beautiful people. Would you agree? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think the, the it's honestly it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, there are plenty of people that are not hospitable to us at all, but there are plenty sure. of very, very decent people. Um, even here in America, you know, though, just, just people are people. They're trying to oh, mm-hmm. say again. I said, even in America, our own Americans aren't kind to one another, let alone in Afghanistan. Right. Well, yeah. I mean that, um, you know, people are people and, That's right. and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to find, uh, you should heads everywhere. Um, there were, That's right. uh, you know, and, and you know, we, we talk about a, a lot of them in, in Kabul. There were a lot of Afghans who served alongside the U.S. at great risk and at great sacrifice. And we made this promise to them that if they did that, they would have a life here with us in America. 
uh, and uh, not, uh, you know, not fulfilling that promise, I think was, a, you know, it's a stain on, on the nation. Mm -hmm. But uh, to get back to your other point about, uh, you know, there all of all of the failures that kind of led up to this, right? Right. Which, which is, it's a very, very valid point. Because if you want to tell the full story of mm -hmm. everything that happened in Afghanistan, then yeah, you got to, you got at the very least, you have to start, you know, beginning 2001. You have to, you have to talk about the fact that, um, you know, we, we deprioritized Afghanistan when, uh, when the Iraq war started. Right. You have to talk, you know, um, talk about uh, the, you know, kind of this whole nation building idea where, um, we, we stopped focusing on, on, you know, doing what military does best, which is um, defeating our enemies on the field of battle. Uh, and you have to, you know, you, and, and more specifically, you know, when you kind of get to the, the latter stages, you absolutely have to talk about um, the Doha agreement, which allowed, you know, which um, was kind of this conditional agreement for U.S. forces to withdraw. Uh, and, and to be frank, we... We have a whole chapter in the book about the Doha Agreement. And, Isn't that where the Taliban came to the White House with Trump? Uh, so I think, yeah, I think Trump had an, like had an he idea. He had the Taliban in the White House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it never actually happened. Uh, he didn't he have them in the. That. Oh, he got it talked was, out was, of the meeting a, with the Taliban. It was a. It was a. Yeah, yeah. So he had a. Uh, I think he he floated the idea of bringing them to Camp David, uh, and for obvious reasons, everyone said that's an absolutely terrible idea isn't it though and yeah. it never happened mm -hmm. uh, but yeah just but again the, the the doha agreement was an absolutely flawed agreement and, and i want to be i want to be very clear i don't care which administration or which political party was in power uh we would have told the exact same story the exact same way because those are the facts and the facts speak for themselves mm -hmm. but but specifically to the doha agreement uh, the the agreement negotiated by Zal Khalizad, who was the a Trump appointed you know special envoy to uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, was a, a a very very flawed agreement. But it was a conditional agreement, and the conditions we said we'll get out. Um, and again, this is it is flawed. But we said we'll get out if. Mm -hmm. You stop harboring Al Qaeda, number one. Mm -hmm. If you stop attacking American troops, number two. Um, and if you agree to, you know, engage in in uh, a peace process, diplomacy and stuff. Yeah. Um, and they never fulfilled any of those obligations. We were killing Al Qaeda in Afghanistan right before the agreement, right after the agreement. And there, are, there, are, you know, card carrying members of Al Qaeda who are. Um, you know, in the Taliban government today, and they continue to attack American forces. So, so this idea we, we focused on the you know, withdrawal period itself, because, well, frankly, if you're going to write 20 years of history in Afghanistan, you're going to need about 10,000 pages. Um, but also because no matter what you think about the previous mistakes or whether we should have gotten out or not, um, mm -hmm things didn't have to end the way that they did. And we make a, I think a very, very convincing case backed up by evidence and firsthand testimony that uh, the way things ended was a hundred percent due to the, the decisions and um, the, the, the complete lack of planning from uh, the, the current administration. Mm-hmm. Now, the lack of planning from the other administration. Yeah. Let me let me be devil's advocate here, right? What do you think I'm going to ask you? You're smart. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, <laughs> aren't you an attorney too? Now? <laughs> Didn't you go ranger school? And, aren't you an attorney also? Yeah, yeah. yeah you're yeah, smart. You're a juris doctorate. That means you know doctorate of law. See, my listener out there, if you didn't realize that. A lawyer goes to school for at least six years. A doctor typically goes to school for about six years. They get a doctorate and they call Dr. Bob at the hospital. Oh, but, if you call me doctor, I'll, I'll hang up right now. Exactly, uh, exactly. But a lawyer is a juris doctorate, correct? Yeah, technically, yeah. yeah. So would that be like a doctor of law? 
That that's technically what it means, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah. but I'm not calling you. I'm calling you a, in the world. If you ever an attorney, like, tried to ask, I'm gonna call you doctor. You know? No, 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 no. Yeah. I just want to explain that. You know, as much as somebody can know about the spleen and the liver and the heart and all those valves, you are skilled in knowing uh, what the comma means in like <laughs> a sentence. You're you're trolling me here, but yeah, I, I mean, I guess. But more, more, uh, yeah, more to the point. Just so, so my question is with planning, right? Planning. Because we know we know what planning means. It's like, um, you know, when Afghanistan, when did it get? When did we? When did the fall of Kabul happen? What was that date? August, August fifteenth of uh, twenty twenty one, right? Yeah, August fifteenth, twenty twenty one was when the uh, the Taliban uh, fully on took drove, over the base. Yeah, yeah, their 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 Humvees were driving. We all saw the aircraft taking off and people trying to hold on to the C five or the yeah. C, mm-hmm. you know. C-47, yeah. uh, C-147 aircraft, you know, a, a lot of that was put yeah. out there yeah, all the time yeah. too, right? A lot of that was shown, like, to show us consistently over and over again, like, look what happened. And then there was the worst of the worst because everybody was crowding into the airport. So somebody took advantage of a situation to create more catastrophe and uh, panic, right? Now, I wasn't there. I have mm-hmm. talked to many, many people who have been there and were even captured by the Taliban after they had already evac'd out 400 different people and they were SAS, right? Special Air Service guys. Mm-hmm. And I and they were beat on their feet at, for like five weeks, captured, never finding out that they were SAS, never finding out that they had moved 400 people out because of what we're talking about, translators, families, people who yeah. helped, you know, that are just going to be killed, which over there, they have this very bar- archaic, you know, law of the land, okay? They still yeah. are uh, right now. I think SoftRep just wrote an article recently talking about how the Taliban are just pissing Afghanistan away right now. Like, they're just putting it into, you know, they have yeah. the option right now to come out and do something with it. Show the it world is, that they can be, yeah. It's a Stone Age ideology, and, and you know, you get a Stone Age society if that, those are the people who are running it. That's but, right. But that's Stone Age about planning, though, Red? Yeah. Really quickly. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You know, so I think the car, like, the original sin of this whole thing yeah. was was giving up Bagram and abandoning Bagram. And what I mean by that is, um, well, first of all, it's important to note that every single military general, every, um, every military advisor who spoke with the White House just pleaded with them not to, mm-hmm. to give up Bagram. And, it, you know, I, it, it's obvious why for a strategic reason, right? There's a lot of standoff distance. It's very defensible. It was actually built by the Soviets. Um, it also has a whole lot of runways. And so it's, I did not know and, that. And it, it's close in proximity to Kabul, which, you know, if we kept kind of those assets available, it would have been, we at least would have had somewhat of a protective radius around, you know, Kabul and then Bagram from which we could do an evacuation. Um, but there's also another, another point to, uh, giving up Bagram, and that is that the suicide bomber himself, mm-hmm. who uh, murdered 13 Americans, that's correct, wounded 45 more, and killed 200 Afghans, was in prison at uh, Parwan Prison, adjacent to Bagram Airfield, or to Bagram, and he was released when the Taliban overran it on August 15th. He was captured in 2017 by the CIA. Mm-hmm. And uh, because he was trying to conduct a uh, suicide bombing in India, of all places, and it was a joint operation between Indian intelligence and the U.S. Uh, and the CIA, the CIA asked to have him in custody. He was an Afghan. We put him there, and then we abandoned Bagram, and he gets released by the Taliban. And eleven days later, he's standing outside of Abbey Gate. Um, and so that alone is is, you know. That's wild, yeah, it, man. You, you know, know that you were in prison and you were staring at four walls or whatever your prison cell is. And all you want to do is get out to blow yourself up because you're so dedicated to your cause. Your whole time in the prison is like, I must get out of here to just blow myself up. You know what? You know what's crazy is it, it, it's it, it's impossible to give you like a logical explanation for an illogical uh, action. Uh, action. Yeah. yeah. But but to your point, so we, we spoke with a an American um uh, who was held hostage by the Taliban for 60 days and, uh, and is now free. Thank God. But he was telling us about some of his time in captivity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he was, he was talking to the, the Taliban guards. And of course, 
you know, anyone who's been to Afghanistan knows like the very first question that comes up in any of these like conversations is like, do you have kids? You know, do you have sons uh, specifically? Uh, and so they, you know, he asked that to the guard and uh, the guard said, no, I'm not married. And then said, uh, I was in the lottery, but uh, I never got picked. And the guy said, the lottery, like, what, you know, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, thinking like some kind of, you know, and he said, oh, to, to, to be a suicide bomber. Um, and, and he, the, the, this, this tal- the Taliban uh, guard felt almost disappointed that, that his name wasn't the one that got picked. Mm-hmm. Um, almost like a revelation so- from them come and say, it's your time. Yeah, it's it, it's again, it's impossible to it's, it. It defies explanation. Well, um, I knew that in like Iraq, they would evil. use they would use individuals that had like Down syndrome. Yeah, and put yeah. them in a burqa. Yeah, and, and they're they're. I mean, they they. The there's innocent, plenty of you know, that, you know, truly, truly, too. truly, just like you know, walk evil. them into this market, and they just because just, they just, were cowards, just, just because they're they're cowardly, and just because they're evil. Yeah, exactly. Uh, evil that's coward. The only way to describe it. You, you know what I mean? And, and, and I mean, just to do that and just to cause that, you know, commotion, these people wanted to get out because, you know, they wanted to leave the country. They thought they had to leave the country. They don't want to be there. They didn't want to, They wanted to be able to go to school. Mm-hmm. The girls were smart, are smart, still smart, should run the world. But here they are, overpowered by these guys with AKs and some of our Blackhawks now. Hmm? Interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, it, there there were plenty of people that are outside the gates that had no connection to the U.S., but there were plenty and, and, and tens of thousands. Um, and it's heartbreaking to hear their stories who who could have gotten out and should yes. have and didn't. Yes. Right. Um, and, and and Americans, uh, you know, and, and, you know, well over a thousand Americans, too, which which is interesting because when, uh, you know, on August 31st, uh, Secretary Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken, said uh it's it's about close to a hundred people a hundred Americans that are left behind, and that is is patently false and and we lay out in Kabul exactly why that's false and, and in fact, just the other day uh Blinken bragged that we had evacuated nine hundred Americans since Kabul fell mm-hmm. and uh so so even by his own numbers that that some type of discrepancy there, huh? just a lie. Now, uh, for your book, you guys went and talked to folks who were like at the gate, right? Almost like yeah. the the Marines yeah. that were there. They were mostly Marines, yeah. right? Is that who you guys probably uh, Marines talked to? and Eighty Second Airborne? We also yeah. talked to, to some some Air Force folks. Uh-huh. You know, a, a lot of a lot of those people are still serving. Um, uh-huh. So we were very careful to try and make sure that we didn't, uh, you know, put them in a really tough spot uh, mm-hmm. where all of a sudden now, you know, the brigade commanders calling down like, "Hey, why are you guys talk, like, you know, talking to?" Dude's writing a book, but yeah, but we talked to a lot, um, you know, more than I can count. And, and what, what they did and mm-hmm. what they dealt with, um, it, it, what they did was heroic. What they dealt with was horrific. And, but they, 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 it literally, it was, it was the best of the American people kind of, you know, uh, on the individual level. And, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the American government at its worst. 